83 cents a month. Yes, only 83 cents a month to receive each month the Nostalgia USA. The only digital magazine that has over 12 hours of audio and video integrated throughout each issue. Now, I know that everyone listening to this podcast now over 11 years, all free, can afford 83 cents a month. So I'm asking that everyone who enjoys my podcast subscribe to the Nostalgia USA today today, which is a real value. Think about it. 83 cents a month, you get this fantastic Nostalgia USA digital magazine and all the podcast. What a deal. Go to oldtimeradiodvd.com today to subscribe. Guaranteed, you'll be glad you did. Let's now join our featured presentation. Capital, my dear Watson. Let us return to our humble abode. 221B two, two, Baker Street, please, Gabby. From London, we present The Abbey Grange, a play for radio by Michael Hardwick, based on the short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Abbey Grange. It was on a bitterly cold and frosty morning during the winter of 1897 that I was awakened by a tugging at my shoulder. It was Sherlock Holmes. Come, Watson, come. The game is afoot. Not a word. Into your clothes and come. Oh. Ten minutes later, we were both in a cab and rattling through the silent streets on our way to Charing Cross Station. It was not until we consumed some hot tea at the station and taken our places in the Kentish train that we were sufficiently thawed, he to speak, and I to listen. Listen to this, Watson. From Abbey Grange, Marsham, Kent, 3.30 a.m. My dear Mr. Holmes, I should be very glad of your immediate assistance in what promises to be a most remarkable case. It is something quite in your line. Except for releasing the lady, I will see that everything is kept exactly as I have found it. But I beg you not to lose an instant, as it is difficult to leave Sir Eustace there. Yours faithfully, Stanley Hopkins. Oh, I said I hope it turns out to be as remarkable as it seems to think. Inspector Hopkins has called me in seven times, and on each occasion his summons has been entirely justified. Uh-huh. Our present research appears to be a case of murder. Oh, you think then that Sir Eustace is dead? I should say so. I think that friend Hopkins will live up to his reputation and that we shall have an interesting morning. Oh, I'm very glad you've come, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Delighted. But uh, I wish I hadn't troubled you after all. Oh? oh? Since the lady has come to herself, she's given us so clear an account of the affair that there's nothing much left for us to do. Oh. You remember that Lewisham gang of burglars? What, the three Randalls? Mm-hmm. Father and two sons. It's their work, not a doubt of it. They did a job at Sydenham a fortnight ago, was seen and described. But um, it's a hanging matter this time. So Eustace is dead, then? Yes. Head battered in with a poker. Uh, Inspector, who was he exactly? Sir Eustace Brackenstall, one of the richest men in Kent. Lady Brackenstall is in the morning room, Mr. Holmes. I think you'd best see her and hear her account. Then we'll examine the dining room together. I have told you all that happened, Inspector Hopkins. Could you not repeat it for me? If you could manage, my lady, I should like Mr. Holmes to hear the facts from your own lips. Well, if you think it necessary... Thank you. Last night, Sir Eustace retired about half past ten. Only my maid, Teresa, was up, and she was in her room at the top of the house. About eleven, I walked round to see that all was right before I went upstairs. Is it your custom to do so? It is. As I approached the dining room window, a broad-shouldered elderly man stepped through the French window, followed by two others. I stepped back. But the fellow struck me a savage blow with his fist over the eye and felled me to the ground. I must have been unconscious for a few minutes. For when I came to myself, I found that they had torn down the bell rope and had secured me tightly to the oaken chair which stands at the head of the dining room table. I was so firmly bound that I could not move, and a handkerchief round my mouth prevented me from uttering any sound. It was at this instant that my unfortunate husband entered the room. (laughs) Please take your time, your ladyship. My 
husband had evidently heard some suspicious sounds and carried his favorite black thorn cudgel in his hand. He rushed at one of the burglars. But another, it was the elderly man, picked the poker out of the grate and struck him a terrible blow. He fell without groan and never moved again. I fainted once more. And when you came to your senses, had they gone? No. I can only have been insensible for a very few minutes. When I opened my eyes, I found that they had collected the silver from the sideboard and that they had drawn a bottle of wine which stood there. Each of them had a glass in his hand. They talked together in whispers, then came over and made sure that I was still securely bound. Finally, they withdrew, closing the window after them. It was quite a quarter of an hour before I got my mouth free, and my screams brought my maid to my assistance. That is really all I can tell you, gentlemen. Any questions, Mr. Holmes? No, I will not impose any further tax upon Lady Brackenstall's patience and time. I should be glad to speak to the maid. Certainly. If you'll be so good as to touch that bell, Dr. Watson. By all means. Um, you have told us, Lady Brackenstall, that one of these three men was elderly. What are the others? They were young men, clean-shaven. They might have been a father with his two sons. I see. You rang your ladyship? Oh, come in, Teresa. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes wishes to speak to you. Yes, my lady. I should just like to hear your account of last night, please. Well, sir, I heard my mistress scream, and down I ran to find a poor lamb tied to a chair and him on the floor lying in his blood. It was enough to drive a woman out of her wits tied there like that. But she never wanted courage to miss Mary Fraser of Adelaide. And Lady Brackenstall of Abbey Grange hasn't learnt new ways. Oh. You've oh. questioned her long enough, you gentlemen. And now she's coming to her room, just with her old Teresa. I should see that her lady should get some rest. She's badly in need of it. Come along now. Old Teresa will look after you. Oh. <laughs> She's been with her all her life. Nursed her as a baby and came with her to England from Australia 18 months ago. Teresa Wright is her name. The kind of maid you don't pick up nowadays. I'm quite sure. And now, Mr. Holmes, the dining room, I think. Well, there's no doubt about the cause of death, Holmes. It'll take a savage blow to do this. Here's the poker, you see, Mr. Holmes. Quite bent with the blow. Mm -hmm. He must be a powerful man, this Elder Randall. He's a rough customer, all right. Well, you should have no difficulty in getting him, not the slightest. There was some idea that he got away to America before now. But since we know the gang are here, I don't see how they can escape. What beats me is how they could have done so mad a thing, knowing that the lady would describe them. Exactly. One would have expected that they would have silenced Lady Brackenstall as well. Though if she were senseless, they would not take her life. Mm. But what about this poor fellow, Hopkins? From what I hear, in spite of all his wealth and title, he very nearly came our way once or twice. Oh? Drink, you know. There's a scandal about his drenching her ladyship's dog with petroleum and setting it on fire. And that was only hushed up with difficulty. Great heaven. Yes. And he once threw a decanter at that maid, Teresa Wright. There was trouble about that. Between ourselves, it will be a brighter house without him. What are you looking at now, Mr. Holmes? This bell rope, which they used to tie Lady Brackenstall to the chair. What about it? When they pulled it down from the wall, the bell in the kitchen must have rung loud. No one could hear it. The servants had all retired. But how did the burglar know that? Ah, exactly, Mr. Holmes. I've asked myself that question. There can be no doubt that this fellow must have known the house and its habits. Therefore, he must have been in close league with one of the servants. Well, when you have Randall, you'll probably find no difficulty in securing his accomplices, Hopkins. That's true. Oh, I told you I was sorry to have brought you down here. Uh, what did they take, by the way? Well, not much. Only half a dozen articles of plate off the sideboard. The Lady Brackenstall thinks that they were so disturbed by the death of Sir Eustace that they didn't ransack the house as they'd intended. And yet they drank some wine. To steady their nerves, I suppose. Um, these, uh, these three glasses on the sideboard have not been touched, Hopkins. No, Mr. Holmes, and the bottle stands there as they left it. Let us look at it. Hello? Hmm? Oh, no, what's this? Lady Brackenstall actually saw the three men drinking, did she not? Yes, yeah, she was clear about that. Well, oh, then there's an end of it. What more is to be said? And yet you must admit that the three glasses are very remarkable, Hopkins. Remarkable? I don't 
seems to hold her. No? Well, well, let it pass. Perhaps when a man has special knowledge and special powers like my own, it rather encourages him to seek a complex explanation when a simpler one is at hand. Well, good morning, Hopkins. I trust that I shall soon have to congratulate you upon a successful conclusion. Come, Watson. I fancy that we may employ ourselves more profitably at home. Holmes, what on earth are you up to now? We get halfway to London, and you suddenly insist on dragging me off the train at this suburban halt, and not a refreshment room in sight. Excuse me, my dear fellow. I'm sorry to make you the victim of what may seem a mere whim, but on my life, I simply can't leave that case in this condition. Every instinct I possess cries out against it. It's wrong. It's all wrong. I'll swear that it's wrong. The lady's story was complete, and the maid's corroboration was exact. What have you to put against that? Three wine glasses, that's all. Three wine Now, sit down on this bench, Watson, uh, until a train for Chislehurst arrives. Thank you. And allow me to lay the evidence before you, imploring you to dismiss from your mind the idea that anything which the maid or her mistress may have said must necessarily be true. Oh, uh, very well, as you wish. These burglars made a considerable haul at Sydenham a fortnight ago. Yes. Burglars who have done a good stroke of business are, as a rule, only too glad to enjoy the proceeds in peace and quiet before embarking on another perilous undertaking. Yes, I suppose that's true. Again, it's unusual for burglars to operate at so early an hour. It is unusual for them to commit murder when their numbers are sufficient to overpower one man. It is unusual for them to be content with a limited plunder when there is much more within their reach. And finally... I should say that it was very unusual for such men to leave a bottle half empty. <laughs> yes. How do all these unusual strike you, Watson? Well, Holmes, their cumulative effect is certainly considerable. And yet each of them is quite possible in itself. But now comes the incident of the wine glasses. Well, what about the wine glasses? Can you see them in your mind's eye? I see them clearly. We're told that three men drank from them. Does that strike you as likely? Oh, why not? There, were, there was wine in each glass. Exactly, but there was sediment only in one glass. Now, what does that suggest to your mind? Well, I should say the last glass to be filled would be most likely to contain sediment. Not at all. That particular bottle was full of it. And it is inconceivable that the first two glasses were clear and the third heavily charged with it. No, I'm inclined to believe that only two glasses were used and the sediment which remained in them both was poured into a third glass to make it appear that three persons had drunk. Well... Yes, I'm convinced that this is so. But if I've hit upon the true explanation of this one small phenomenon, then in an instant the case rises from the commonplace to the exceedingly remarkable. You mean that Lady Brackenstall and her maid have deliberately lied to us? If so, it can only mean they have some very strong reason for covering the real criminal. In which case we must arrive at our solution for ourselves without any help from them. And here, Watson, is the Chislehurst train. Good. I imagine they'll be surprised to see us return so soon to the Abbey Grange. Well, I hope you're satisfied now, Holmes. You've gone over this blessed dining room with a fine-tooth comb, almost. It's all right, Watson. We've got our case. What? One of the most remarkable in our collection. But, dear me, how slow-witted I've been. How near I came to committing the blunder of my lifetime. But you've got your men? Man, Watson. Man. Only one. But a very formidable person. Strong as a lion. Witness the blow which bent that poker. Six foot three in height, active as a squirrel, dexterous with his fingers. Where was the clue that has made your mind up? That bell rope. That? That? You saw me climb up to examine it. It is cut clean off three inches from the top. Yes, but... Kindly I... ring for the maid while we reconstruct what happened. All right. Now, the man needed the rope. He wouldn't tear it down for fear of giving the alarm by ringing the bell. So he sprang up onto the mantelpiece, I could see the impression in the dust, and got his knife to bear upon the cord. I could not reach the place by at least three inches, from which I infer that he is at least three inches a bigger man than I. Ah, I see. We've not yet met our Waterloo, Watson, but this is our Marengo, for it begins in defeat and ends in victory. Ah, Teresa. Uh, kindly come in and close the door. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Teresa, I am shocked and deeply distressed to learn that on one unhappy occasion the late Sir Eustace Brackenstall actually threw a decanter at you. Well, sir, since you raised the matter, I won't deny that it's true. It's not for me to speak ill of the dead, mind you. Oh, quite, quite. 
but I heard him call my mistress a name. I told him he would not dare to speak so if her brother had been there. Then it was he threw it at me. He could have thrown a dozen if he'd left my bonny bird alone. He was always ill-treating her, sir, and she was too proud to complain. She won't even tell me all that he did to her. Heaven forgive me that I should speak like this of him now, the sly fiend. But a fiend he was if ever one walked the earth. When did she meet him, by the way? He arrived in June, and she met him in July. They were married in January of last year. What was it you wanted, sir? Oh, uh, I wondered if Lady Brackenstall might feel able to spare me a few moments of her time. Uh, if you think she's up to it, of course. I don't doubt she'll see you, sir. Ah. She's down in the morning room if you'll follow me. But you won't ask too much of her, sir. She's gone through all that flesh and blood will stand. I do hope you've not come to cross-examine me again, Mr. Holmes. No, I will not cause you any unnecessary trouble, Lady Brackenstall. Believe me, my whole desire is to make things easy for you. But I'm convinced that you are a much-tried woman. Now, if you'll treat me as a friend and trust me, you may find that I will justify your trust. What do you want me to do? To tell me the truth. Mr. Holmes. No, 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 Lady Brackenstall, it's no use. You may have heard of any little reputation which I possess. I will stake it all on the fact that your story is an absolute fabrication. You are an impudent fellow to talk to my mistress like that. Do you mean to say she has told you a lie? Have you nothing to tell me, Lady Brackenstall? I have told you everything. Think once more. Would it not be better to be frank? I have told you all I know. I'm sorry. Come along, Watson. Now oh, you've rubbed them both up the wrong way, Holmes. Where's it got us? It may be a hit or it may be a miss. I'll just scribble a note for the lodgekeeper to give Stanley Hopkins when he returns. And then I think our next scene of operations must be the shipping office of the Adelaide Southampton line. It's at the end of um, Pell Mell, if I remember right. Uh, pray be seated, gentlemen. Thank you, Grandfather. Uh, uh, now, Mr. Holmes... What can I do for you? I'm making one or two inquiries concerning two ladies who arrived in this country from Adelaide in uh, June of 95. June 95? Yes. Well, that should be easy. Here's the uh, ledger for that month. Oh, a Miss Fraser and her maid, Miss Wright. April, May, June. Easier still. Only one of our vessels arrived that month, the uh, Rock of Gibraltar. Biggest and best in our fleet. Ah, yes, quite, quite. And here's the passenger list. Uh, Miss... Uh, Miss Fraser. 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 Ah, yes, here it is. Miss Mary Fraser from Adelaide, travelling with her maid, Miss Theresa Wright. Uh, that's what you wanted? Capital. Uh, may I ask where the Rock of Gibraltar is now? Now? Oh, she's halfway to Australia, somewhere south of Suez. I see. I imagine her officers are still much the same as they were 18 months ago. Naturally, Mr. Holmes. The company flatters itself that its servants remain with it for their lifetime service. Yes, indeed. Very few exceptions. No exceptions in this particular case. I don't think. Oh, just a moment, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, Captain Croker. The master of the Rock of Gibraltar? Oh, no, no. Uh, he was first officer on the voyage you refer to. Oh. He's recently been promoted to captain and left the ship. Matter of fact, he takes charge of our newest vessel, the Bass Rock, sailing from Southampton in two days' time. Mm. Captain Croker. Splendid seaman. Magnificent record. Not an officer in the fleet to touch Jack Croker. Well, I, I'm much obliged to you for your assistance. And now I think we've trespassed enough upon your valuable time. I'm getting rather lost, Holmes. Oh? You haven't explained what, if anything, our visit to that shipping office achieved. You sent off a telegram, which you didn't find it necessary to let me see, and then you drive to Scotland Yard, sit outside in the cab for ten minutes, lost in thought, and then drive back here to 221B without going into the yard at all. What's it all about? I couldn't do it, Watson. Couldn't do what? Once that warrant was made out, nothing on earth would save it. Once or twice in my career, I feel that I have done more real harm by my discovery of the criminal than ever he had done by his crime. I've learned caution now, and I had rather play tricks with the law of England than with my own conscience. Let us know a little more before we act. Oh, Holmes, really, I could... Come in. Ah, Hopkins, do come in. 
You or landlady told me to come up, Mr. Holmes. Right, right. I was expecting to see you. Take a seat. Thank you. Mr. Holmes, I believe you're a wizard. Oh, how so? How on earth could you know that the stolen silver was at the bottom of the pond in the Abbey Grange grounds? I didn't know. But you told me to try the pond in, in the note you left with the lodgekeeper. Well, I just thought it was possible. We were told the men left by the French window. Almost immediately outside it, there was the pond. Could there be a better hiding place? Ah, a hiding place. Yes. As I see it all now. Excellent, Mr. Holmes. But uh, I, I must tell you, I've had a bad setback. A setback, Inspector? Yes, Dr. Watson. The Randall gang were arrested in New York this morning. You... New York? Dear me, Hopkins. That is certainly rather against your theory that they committed a murder in Kent last night. It's fatal, Mr. Holmes. Absolutely fatal. Still, there are other gangs of three besides the Randalls. Or it may even be some new gang the police have never heard of. It's perfectly possible. Now, how about stopping to take dinner with us? No, thank you all the same. There's no rest for me till I've got to the bottom of this business. Well, goodbye, then. Oh, let us know how you get on. Yes, I will. Goodbye, thank you. Well, Holmes? I expect developments, Watson. When? Within a few minutes. I dare say you thought I acted rather badly to Stanley Hopkins just now. No, I trust your judgment. A very sensible reply. Ah, I hear a footfall upon our stair. The time has come. You will now be present at the last scene of a remarkable little drama. Come in. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Come in, Captain Croker. Take a seat. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Captain? How do you do? You got my telegram. I got your telegram, and here I am. What do you wish me to do? To give me a true account of all that happened at the Abbey Grange last night. A true account, mind you, with nothing added and nothing taken off. I know so much already that if you go one inch off the straight, I'll blow this police whistle from my window, and the affair goes out of my hands forever. No, oh, damn it, I'll chance it. I believe you're a man of your word. But I'll say this first. So far as I'm concerned, I regret nothing. And I'm afraid of nothing. I would do it all again and be proud of it. I'll tell you my story, gentlemen. And then I'll ask you as man to man what less I could have done. A very fair offer. Pray proceed. I expect that you know that I first met Mary Fraser when she was a passenger and I was first officer of the Rock of Gibraltar. From that moment, she was the only woman for me. Indeed. But she was never engaged to me. It was all love on my side and all good companionship and friendship on hers. When we parted, she was a free woman. But I could never again be a free man. Well, next time I came back from sea, I heard of her marriage to this bracken stall. Oh, she was born for all that's beautiful and dainty. Title and money. Who could carry them better than she could? I just rejoiced that good luck had come her way. And that she hadn't thrown herself away on a penniless sailor. That's how I love Mary Fraser, you see. I understand perfectly. Go on. Well, I never thought to see her again. But last voyage, I was promoted. And I've been staying since with my people at Sydenham waiting for my new boat. One day, out in the country, I met Teresa Wright, her maid. She told me about him about everything. Well, I tell you, gentlemen, it nearly drove me mad. This, this drunken hound daring to raise his hand to her whose boots he wasn't worthy to lick. Well, from Teresa, I learned the ways of the house. Mary used to sit up reading downstairs. I crept round there last night and scratched at the window till she heard me. Who is it? Who's there? Mary, it's me. Jack. Jack Croker. Mary, let me in. I must speak to you. Oh, I, I can't. You must. Oh. Oh, quickly, then. Can you climb through? Just watch me. Now, now Mary, I, I want you to tell me. And the truth, mind. Is it true what I've been hearing from Teresa? Does he hit you? Knock you about? He... Oh, what's the use of pretending? Yes, Jack. Whatever you've heard, I'm sure it's no more than the truth. Who's there? Oh, God. Who? 
Teresa, he went for me. I had this poker. I think, I think he must be... Oh. Yes, he's dead. And good riddance at last. Well, what are we going to do? Now, listen to me, Jack Croker. What's happened tonight is the best thing that could have happened for my poor lamb's sake. But we must work quickly. It's got to seem as if burglars did this. What? You must do exactly as I say. We're going to hide some of the silver and leave the French window open as if they'd escape that way. And we'll tie my mistress to that chair. Look, that bell rope. Get it down, we'll use that. While you're doing it, I'm going to tell her the tale she must tell when all this comes out. Now, hurry, we've no time to waste. There, 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 my poor dove. Old Teresa's going to make everything all right. I opened a bottle of wine, and Mary and I took a glass apiece to calm us. Teresa suggested pouring some off into a third glass. To look as if some gang of three had done it. Well, that's the whole truth of it, gentlemen. If it costs me my neck. Captain Croker, I believe every word you've said, for you've hardly told me a thing I didn't know. No one but an acrobat or a sailor could have got up to that bell rope. And no one but a sailor could have tied the knots with which it was fastened to the chair. Only once had this lady been brought into contact with sailors... And that was on her voyage. And it was someone of her own class of life, since she was trying hard to shield him, and so showing that she loved him. Now look here, Captain. We'll do this in due form of law. You are the prisoner. Watson. Yes? You are a British jury. And I never met a man who was more eminently fitted to represent one. <laughs> I am the judge. Now, gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the evidence. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, my lord. You are acquitted, Captain Croker. So long as the law does not find some other victim, you are safe from me. Come back to this lady in a year. And may her future and yours justify us in the judgment which we have pronounced this night. That was The Abbey Grange by Michael Hardwick based on the short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes was played by Carlton Hobbs and Dr. Watson by Norman Shelley. Production for the BBC was by Robin Midgley. <laughs>